Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Susan Evans, who is the Chief of Surgical Critical Care and the Vice Chair of Research here at the Carolinas Medical Center. Uh, her topic today is on traumatic brain injury with changing practice to limit secondary brain injury. Obviously, brain injury uh, is a common widespread issue. Uh, we get uh, variations from minor injuries, which can still be uh, impacting uh, to people's lives and careers to uh, severe traumatic brain injuries. Uh, but we do have some opportunities to impact uh, some of our outcomes here. Uh, and relevant to this talk, there's a lot of new information uh, have been coming down. And I think the new uh, Trauma and Quality, Quality Improvement Project uh, resource manual for the uh, best practices for traumatic brain injury will be coming out uh, shortly as well. So again, uh, Dr. Evans, our Chief of Surgical Critical Care, who's uh, dealing with uh, several traumatic brain injuries in the ICU today, uh, is here for our, our, our talk. Dr. Evans. Thanks, Ron. And yes, we, we do have quite a few traumatic brain injuries in the ICU right now. So um, we, we actually discussed that yesterday that our list is full of patients with traumatic brain injury. So I'm going to, this is going to be a little bit of an interaction, interactive talk. They're going to I'm going to try virtually to do this as an interactive talk. There are a couple of times where I'm going to ask you to either raise your hand. So make sure you find your button at the top for raising your hand or where your mute button is so you can unmute yourself and talk if you prefer to do it that way and and or the chat. So um, a couple of a couple of opportunities are going to come up and I want to want to make sure you know where those buttons are right away. So we have three different things we're going to actually get through in the in the next um, 45 minutes or so. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about avoiding secondary injury in severe TBI. We're going to move into the antifibrinolytic therapy, specifically tranexamic acid. And then we're going to talk about effective clinical practice change processes, because that is so important as we are trying to figure out the best ways to manage our care. So traumatic brain injury. So here we, here we have um, some outstanding athletes, and let's say one of them does a header in the middle of the Olympics. Not that that ever happens, but if they do, not only do they do a header, but they end up with a really tra bad tra traumatic brain injury. Um, now they might have had a helmet on, but when you're going 80 miles per hour in the Super G, you're going to end up with a bad brain injury anyway. So when they come in, we have to think about things like their initial brain contusion, um, the, and then the, the disruption of the blood-brain barrier that happens during that, um, as well as that then hemorrhage, whether or not it's a small volume hemorrhage or large, large volume hemorrhage, and then the actual neuron injuries themselves. The neurons can be torn and injured um, separate from actually having blood in the brain. Um, and then all of these things result in a release of cytokines, chemokines, damage associated molecular patterns. So those are all chemicals that our brain releases when it is stressed and injured. We can't do much about any of those things, not any of those initial primary things. So what we have to do is focus on these secondary things. And the secondary things, if we if we think about excitotoxicity, that's, that's probably mostly seizure, but also we think about excitotoxicity when the patients are having um, what we cons would consider autonomic dysregulation. Their heart rate's going up, their blood pressure's going up, their respiratory rate's going up. So their brain is being stimulated um, in really abnormal ways. They'll have associated oxidative stress, inflammation, program cell death, and then the myelin sheaths will actually start to break down. So that coating around the around the cells, and then they're going to have they can have some autoimmunity even to their own cells and neurodegeneration. But what does that really look like to us? Well, poor function. They're not awake. They're not interactive, or they can't do a a, a large variety of of things. Um, they have cognitive decline, they have lots of psychologic alterations, and then that can lead to chronic disability. And I put the, the little figure in the bottom left, which is really hard to see, but I did that to come to prompt me to remember to tell you to talk about the, the, that the all of these inflammatory processes that are happening in the brain then go proceed to affect the body. Other organs, the lungs, the kidneys, um, even the liver to a certain extent are, are functioning abnormally if they're getting abnormal signals from the brain when the brain is no longer working properly. And so they then have abnormal processes, which results in a greater inflammation. And that inflammation then leads back to the brain again. And so we get in a pretty big cycle. And so our job when we're focusing on secondary injury is to see if we can, we can head off that cycle head off that process where these primary injuries are leading to leading to the secondary injuries. So 
what are the things we need to do? Well, well, there, there are things that are commonly associated with an overall um, main, maintaining systemic hemo, hem, homeostasis. So we need to maintain their oxygenation, and oftentimes that means that we need to intubate them. We need to control their intracranial pressure to keep it in somewhat of a normal range. We need to maintain their, their systemic blood pressure in a normal or maybe mildly elevated range. When um, we have a lot of patients who, who might have come out of the OR after having had some sort of a brain injury, and oftentimes their blood pressure parameters have been, the orders have been said, you know, keep them lower, keep them lower than 150, systolic pressures lower than 150. The literature is really not necessarily supporting that. They're saying, it's saying that they can be normal to, to somewhat elevated. And the reason probably is, or at least that we assume it is, is because they need to be able to perfuse those areas that are bruised and get enough blood flow to those areas. And so when there's a little bit of pressure and there's swelling, that you need to have a higher pressure head to go in to provide that oxygen to those cells. We need to maintain generally normal temperature. In, in a few occasions, hypothermia is probably preferable, um, and I'll show you one of those occasions, but mostly normal blood pressure. We need to resuscitate them so that the rest of their body is getting enough fluid, um, and then we need to make sure to prevent, this slide's taking a long time, but prevent hemorrhage. <laughs> the, the next one's gonna say prevent hemorrhage. Um, and so that's, a, that's what, part of what we're gonna be talking about in just a minute. Here we go, okay. Um, and so we have actually, in order to try to address these issues, we have put together guidelines for management of our patients. And, and what I have kind of refreshed my mind about as we are in our site visit year, and we're gonna to need to make sure we have our guidelines up to speed, um, we, we need to make sure that our guidelines are, are, are providing the information that we want. And this one in particular reminded me when we um, are focusing on limiting secondary injury, the hypotension, hypoxia, and hypothermia, we have that on the third line of the second box of elevated intracranial pressure. That's probably not where we want it. We probably want avoid hypotension, hypoxia, and hypothermia at the very top of the slide um, for how we're going to be managing patients because those are the most important things that we really need to be doing and catching everyone's attention. But in addition to that, other things we're going to do to try to help suppress suppress that inflammation and stress. So we're going to sedate the patients. We're going to keep the head of the bed elevated so that they their pressure can come down. We might drain their CSF. We might give them hyperosmolar therapy or neuromuscular blockade. And then when we're going to go to the secondary injuries, it's going to freeze. There we go. Um, when we're going to go to the secondary um, tier uh, management, um, we might consider lumbar drain. As we move into our um, guideline or site visit year and we make guideline revisions, we might need to just get rid of this because we really don't use lumbar drains very much, but it is an option to help decrease patients' intracranial pressure. Um, we do sometimes use the high-dose barbiturate therapy. Um, and here is where we might consider my mild, moderate hypothermia in patients who really have highly elevated intracranial pressure that is difficult to manage, partly because we have lost almost lost the ability to use um, decompressive craniectomy. The most recent trials, there were two rather large trials um, that, that were completed about three years ago regarding decompressive craniectomy. And because their results suggest that while we have people who might live longer, they don't live better because we end up trading people who are actually surviving because we decrease their intracranial pressure just enough but they have very poor neurologic function. And because of those results, you will not see our neurosurgeons do plain old decompressive craniectomy for elevated intracranial pressure, pressure very often anymore. Now they might do a, a, a craniectomy because they are going to take a lesion out, they're going to take out a subdural hematoma, so they're taking out some blood or perhaps even some necrotic brain or something like that and not be able to put the skull back on. And so they'll leave it off because it's it has swollen so much while they're doing the procedure, but they don't usually take them just to decrease the intracranial pressure, primarily because of those two trials, which, which have, were fairly remarkably um, pronounced to show that there's poor outcome. Okay. So um, the next part we want to talk about regarding um, the uh, traumatic brain injury is how do we control hemorrhage? 
I was on call um, Christmas week and went down to the trauma bay. And as I was to a, to a trauma code, and as I was coming to the trauma bay, the patient was getting close to being ready to leave the trauma bay. And so, and and, and they were telling me, okay, so he got his, um, he's going to CT scanner. Um, he has a, a traumatic brain injury and, and he's got his tranexamic acid. And, and I kind of bristled a little bit because I thought, why do you get tranexamic acid? Um, that is something that we typically have avoided in brain injured patients. Um, although recent, the, the most re there was a recent trial um, evaluating it. And, but the reason we've avoided in traumatic brain injured patients is because traumatic brain injured patients have a coagulopathy that is really mixed. They have a high ri risk of thrombus and they have a risk of hemorrhage. And so it's a very, it's kind of a, it's a challenging picture to figure out who, what is going to happen to these patients. And so I said, well, why, why did we give it? And I probably should have stepped back a little bit. And they said, well, because of the CRASH-3 trial. And so I had interpreted the CRASH-3 trial differently than it had been interpreted by the people who were managing the patient. And so I thought, oh gosh, I got to go back and reread it and figure out why people are interpreting it differently. But um, we're going to talk about the CRASH-3 trial in a minute, but it prompted me then to, to try to figure out what to do with these patients um, and, and how we need to manage them. So we're going to talk about blood clotting first. And so whoever wants to put in the chat, you can see that I have a something plus something equals blood clot. So there are two things that make a blood clot. And I'm going to open up my chat box so that I can look, wait for people to say what the two things are that we need to make a blood clot. Or one thing. Ron, I know you're over there. All right, we got a platelets. We got two platelets. What else do you need to go with the platelets? Uh, close. FFP turns into fibrin. Um, so yeah, so so fibrin and and platelets are the things that we need to make blood clot. And our platelets account for about 80% of the strength of our blood clot, which is fairly helpful to understand when you have somebody who's hemorrhaging, because if we have people who are hemorrhaging and um, they don't have enough platelets or their platelets aren't working very well, then we're going to have trouble with them with them being able to clot. And so it's an, it's an important element of the, of the blood clot itself. So when we clot, the, the platelets um, get activated, they reach out their little hands and they grab onto the fibrin and they grab onto the one another in order to be able to make a nice strong clot. Um, and then they make that clot. And then over time, that clot has to break down because eventually you don't want to have um, ongoing um, negative process of, of clot that, that causes um, occlusion of your blood vessels. And so we have um, fibrinolysis that breaks it down. If you have too much fibrinolysis, that's where tranexamic acid comes in because tranexamic acid needs to break down the clot. Um, I mean, needs, needs to prevent the clot breakdown if somebody is hemorrhaging. So this is what was studied in the CRASH-2 trial is, is fibrinolysis um, inhibition by tranexamic acid. And so CRASH-2 trial was a trial of a gazillion patients. It was 20,000 some patients in many, many hospitals. And what they wanted to do was determine, since they had figured out that tranexamic acid limits bleeding in um, elective patients, they wanted to see if it limited bleeding in trauma patients. And so the patient population, you can see if you can read it, it's pretty small for you, but but um, what you can see is that the patient patients had to either be hemorrhaging with a blood pressure of less than 90 or a heart rate greater than a 10, great heart rate greater than 110, or at risk of that hemorrhage um, in order to be included. And then they were they were essentially randomized into placebo and treatment. Then the treatment <clears throat> is a gram um, bolus and then a, and then an infusion of a gram over eight hours. And what we know is that Patients who got the tranexamic acid, you can see, had a lower mortality by 1.5% lower mortality. But and and normally that's probably not a huge difference. I mean, if you, if you were going to, if I had cancer and you were going to give me a chemotherapeutic agent and say you're going, you have a 16% chance of dying in the in a year if we don't give it to you, and a 14.5% chance of dying if we do give it to you, and it makes me 
nauseated and throw up and lose my hair and feel sick all the time, I'd probably say I'll take the 1.5% and not have that chemotherapeutic agent, right? So the difference of 14.5 and 16%, I think is important for us to know because, because it's a very small improvement in mortality when we give this drug without any sort of testing, without, any, without knowing is the patient really hemorrhaging and does the patient really need it? They also had a slightly improved um, uh, function, function, uh, neurologic function afterwards at that 14.7 versus 13.3. But what's important is we have to know if it's going to decrease people from hemorrhaging, is it going to do the opposite and make them clot and put them at risk of venous thromboembolism or, or other, other events? And it did not. So there's no difference in the, in the um, patients who had thromboembolism and the patients who didn't. What is important, and I think we kind of forget this a little bit, perhaps when we're in the trauma bay, um, is that if patients got it within less than an hour of, um, of their injury, then they did probably have a benefit, their mortality benefit. You can see the tail of that of the line on the top at the less than one hour is very far from that midline, that one, one line. And if it's lower than the one line and doesn't cross it, then it's statistically different. The patients who got a grade between one and three hours, their, the, their tail of their line actually goes over the one, which means it's not statistically different. And the patients who get it greater than three hours after their injury, it also doesn't go over the line, but it's in the opposite direction, which means their, their mortality risk is potentially higher. And so we have to keep that in mind, I think, when we're administering it, because, that, because our patients are at risk of not benefiting from this drug. Having said that, the patients, the patients who received it were, were considered to do better, um, but traumatic brain injury patients had been excluded from this study. Um, and so, this, so the next uh, evaluation was, well, if patient traumatic brain injury patients are hemorrhaging, would they benefit from it as well? And so this one is focused on an isolated traumatic brain injury, the CRASH-3 trial did. And so it also has a gazillion patients. This is 12,000 instead of 20,000, a bunch of hospitals, 175 hospitals, a lot of different countries involved in this one, mostly in Europe. Um, and so what they, what they evaluated was patients, and I think I have an error, yep, patients who had any intracranial bleeding on CAT scan, so a tiny bit of bleeding or a lot of bleeding on CAT scan and a GC or, or a GCS of 12 or less. So they might have had a GCS of 12 or less and no bleeding. They might have had bleeding on CT and a GCS of 15. Those patients can all be included in this study. And that's probably not what most of us would consider patients that we want to include in a study where we're going to try to limit hemorrhage. Um, however, it's, you're somewhat limited in what you can do when you're trying to push it further and further toward the um, timing of injury, because if we want to give it to the ambulances, they, we can't use sophisticated things and we can't use CAT scans and that, you know, for the most part, so we have to try to come up with other measures. Similar to the other one, they did a placebo and, um, ran, and or randomized them to um, a gram bolus plus um, a gram over eight hours. And similar to the CRASH, well, kind of similar to the CRASH-2 trial, what they found in all patients with the, is that there was actually no difference in, the, in, in mortality if they had the, the tranexamic acid or not, even when you exclude the patients who are GCS of three and bilaterally unreactive pupils because they, that, they were excluded in the second evaluation because the thought was that there's nothing that we can do to imp impact their mortality. It's just high. So the one group of patients who had um, a little a little bit of potential benefit, 5.8% mortality versus 7.5% mortality. So if you're round, maybe that's six to seven or six to eight, something like that. Um, that those patients um, were mild to moderate brain injury. So that could be all the way up to a GCS of 15 um, with a little bit of blood in their head if we give it to them. So is there something else besides the hemorrhage control that's happening with the tranexamic acid that's perhaps giving it a little bit of a, of a mortality benefit? Um, and then, and we all, this is similar to the CRASH-2 trial. It did not, ha was not associated with increased um, thrombotic risk. What is fairly important in this one, similar to the other one, is that 
patients who received it early, if you, if you just look at the severe patients, they have no benefit at all. But the patients who are mild and moderate, if they receive it really early, if they receive it within seconds of their injury, then it probably does have a little bit of a mortality benefit. And we do or do not know what that might mean because I'm not totally convinced it's a hemorrhage benefit because um, that would have to be very um, fairly impactful on patients who didn't have much hemorrhage. But by the time you get to 180 minutes, so three hours, you're again crossing the line where there, there's, there's potentially no benefit and, and it's starting to go toward risk. So that earlier dosing is really, really important. There was a similar trial, large trial, not quite as big, that was done um, mostly in, this was mostly in North America at the same time for that at a hospital trying to get the tranexamic acid given earlier. Um, this one um, had only a thousand patients and, it, and interestingly, they, they did three different treatments. They did placebo, they did the normal tranexamic acid of a gram bolus and a gram over eight hours, and then they did a two gram bolus um, as well. But some, initial findings were um, combining those two tranexamic acid doses, and they were not looking at more focusing on mortality. They were looking more at neurologic outcome at six months. And what we can see is that is that the placebo and tranexamic acid groups were not different. The 62% um, good neurologic function versus 65% uh, was, was not different because they didn't have 20,000 patients. They had 1,000 patients instead. But this part was is somewhat interesting, and it may be, may be the, something that we need to keep in mind, and that is the gray and green lines are the placebo group and the group that had our normal dosing of a bolus initially of, of a gram and, and a gram over eight hours. That peach line that looks like it's probably trying to separate out from the other two is actually the, the group that had a two gram bolus when they started and their mortality is looking like it might be lower. So perhaps a dosing change might be the thing that is gonna, gonna have some impact in a positive direction. Okay, so now is response time again. Should we be using tranexamic acid in patients with isolated TBI? So when I went down to the trauma bay and was startled by the fact that we were using it, should I have been, maybe not been startled and been on board and said, we should probably be using it? What do you guys think? I think I'm, my thing is a little slow because I had a whole lot of things pop up after I did the last one. We can either, how about hands raised? Should we be using it? We got one. Mike Thomason, Ron saying, okay, we're getting we're getting a few people who think we should be using it. Okay. Well, I'm not sure using it is I'm I'm still kind of up in the air here. I think the uh, I think some things that sound like they are meaningful and make sense uh and, and the long term don't actually end up doing that. So I think the uh Data needs to be a little bit stronger for me to support um, an earlier or ensuring that this is something that we do. We do a lot of things that don't necessarily have a good outcome. Mm -hmm. It sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. This one is actually for me quite hard because <laughs> um, while while there might be some benefit, and frankly, some of the benefit. Um, Okay, so the question of what's the harm in giving it right at, right after, as long as we give it early. Um, while there were things that we studied, like, like venous thromboembolism, that we have an idea that they probably are equal, so perhaps we aren't hurting patients, it worries me a little bit, be, since hemorrhage is not a major problem of brain injury, as in volume of hemorrhage, people don't exsanguinate typically from their brain injury. Now they might exsanguinate from their scalp, but they don't typically exsanguinate from their brain injury. So volume of blood is not usually something that's gonna kill them. Is that increased volume of blood going to make their brain injury worse? Perhaps, um, but I also kind of, I really kind of wonder if there's something else about the tranexamic acid that's helping. And so we need to know the countermeasure. If it's helping something, is it also hurting something that we're not knowing because we don't know why it's helping? And I'm not totally sure about that. But 
all those things. So let's say we have to decide. Let's say we're the we're the decision makers, and we have to decide because the, because in good patient care, we really need to be doing things this similarly, uh, this the same way in general, so that we can say, look, this is the way we manage this thing, and it's good because we've tested our patients and we know our patients are doing well. Or this is the way we manage our thing. And it's not very good and we need to figure out a way to fix it. And we need to change our practice in order to do better and take care of our patients better. So I'm going to ask you to put your hands down if you were just voting. Um, and if you were not just voting and want to make a comment, because now I see Christmas's hand is up. Um, do you, are you making, I'm going to stop there and let you make a comment if you have a comment. Yeah. Um. Dr. Evans, great presentation so far. And, uh, you know, I'd agree. This is this is one of the areas I think in adults, especially, we're really kind of up in the air on this. But um, on I think when it comes to children, this is one of those instances where in the pediatric population that there is actually some some pretty good data that would go against giving these uh, kids with isolated TBIs TXA because what um, Barb Gaines and her group found out of Pitt is that these kids that come in are actually most often in fibrinolysis shutdown rather than hyperfibrinolysis. So when they started looking at this group and the kids that were, were getting TXA, it was kind of overkill, if, if you will. And that what happened is in you know, in these kids that did come in and hyperfibrinolysis, that they actually auto-corrected with just getting normal resuscitation without throwing TXA at them. But um, that's that's one of the you know one of the few instances where I would say that we probably have better data not to mm -hmm. give TXA with isolated TBIs you know, or isolated, you know, blunt, where, unless you're massively transfusing, et cetera. But um, the adult population, uh, you know, I think the verdict is still really out on them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point and, and, and a very interesting uh, physiology as well, that, you know, that they're able to do that. Dr. Diefenbacher. Yeah, mine's the same comment uh, in terms of fibrinolytic shutdown, normal lysis or hyperfibrinolysis. I wonder if we could be more educated in our decision making based on uh, early availability of a TEG result to better characterize uh, their actual lysis. And maybe the uh, heterogeneity of, of responses that we see in the various studies is related to the fact that we actually don't know what their lytic status is. Right. Yeah, I think that one is a big one, and I, I am I am a huge proponent of let's assess them and decide and treat them based on what we what we want to give them. Similarly to platelet inhibitors, you know, the concept of not everybody is actually responsive to a platelet inhibitor, and so they might not bleed more than than somebody who's not taking it because they're actually not um, not inhibited in their platelet platelet function might be normal in fact. So my my inclination would be to assess it, but that kills the idea of giving it early. And so um, I'm not going to make us decide today. Otherwise, we're the, we're going to freeze the talk and we're not going to be able to go anywhere. But what I am going to suggest is it is good for us to think through these things and make a decision together as a team and decide what we're going to do next because we need to learn how to make these changes and, and, and pick up on um, new literature and, in, and in, um, incorporate it into our practices as we move along. And we do that well in some ways and we don't do that well in other ways and so one of the the um, concepts that we have i think is that we we have pockets of excellence in our healthcare system in atrium in cmc and also in the nation where things are done really well um, but we don't necessarily do a great job of spreading it it's difficult to spread it and so we are lim we limit our ability to really move things forward that way but it's important because because any improvement that we make is actually going to require that we make a change. Um, 
not all of, all the changes we make are going to lead to improvement. And so we have to figure that out. But if we want to improve our care, we need to be able to make changes which are going to improve the practice. It's kind of like the concept of can't score without shooting. So whether or not that's Wayne Gretzky who said that in hockey or somebody in basketball, you know, that's that's kind of prevalent throughout the sporting world is you, you can't score without shooting. And so if we don't give it a shot and dig in and try to make changes, then we're not going to improve our practice to be doing the optimal thing. But that's really hard. And so why don't we change practice enough? Well, sometimes there's an obstruction in the path. There is something that's preventing us from doing it and we just can't do it. Sometimes you don't know really what's in the water below you. And so you might be sabotaged by what's below you or who's below you. And they might actually eat you up if you end up in the water of trying to make a change. Or you might have it, you might get um, hurt from above. There might be threats from above that prevent you from making the change. You might not know which way the path is. You might, you know, do I do I go left here or do I go right here? I don't I don't know which way I'm supposed to go and am I gonna get lost in this in this river? And sometimes it looks like it's just hard. It looks like fun um, once you get up there, or it looks at least majestic when you get up there, but it's darn hard to get to that place of having made a good change. And so those are the things that prevent us from doing it. But what we have to do if those are preventing us from doing it is we have to believe that it's worth getting there. So we have to believe that it's worth climbing the mountain to get to that view. And so I'm going to were um, proposed to us today that we work on figuring out how we climb the mountain. And so part of that is, or all of that perhaps, is your team, right? Bringing your team together. And so figuring out ways that your team, you can get your team who's focusing on their own thing and looking looking all the other direction and not paying attention to all everyone focusing in the same direction and trying to row in the same direction at the same time. And, and what is it that we need to do to get there? There are, there are a fair amount of opportunities for figuring out how we can do that. And, and there are a lot of processes that are recommended for figuring out how to do that. And they all generally include things like coming up with the content for the change. What is it that actually needs to be changed? Is your leadership team committed to making that happen? Because if the frontline team is doing it, but the leadership team is not necessarily on board, they're not going to solve the problems that are going to come about with every change. We're going to have barriers to making changes. Um, we need to have a prioritization process because there are so many opportunities for making change that we are we can't do them all. Um, and, and so we have to really figure out what which ones we're going to focus on then we have to be determined to do it because we have to be determined to come overcome those barriers. We have to come up with a process. What is it that we're gonna do to make this change? And then we have to have the team that's really gonna work together to enact the process. All right, here's the next um, participation activity. So who's this? You can type or you can shout it out. An unretired quarterback. <laughs> as of as of last night, he's I think he's unretired as of last night. I agree. Okay. So this this Tom Brady, so he is a seven, seven time Super Bowl winning quarterback. Um, how many of you knew that? I need hands raised. How many people knew who that was? We're getting quite a few. We're getting there, we're getting there, we're getting there. Okay, so so most people knew that. And I'm going to guess that there are a number of people who aren't necessarily football fans who who knew that as well. All right, next one. Oh, I'm sorry. Put your hands down. Or I can actually un un lower all the hands. Maybe I can't. No, that's only in Zoom. So hands down until we hear the name of this one. Oh, people are putting hands back up. Maybe it's my computer's just slow. I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Um, all right, Gronk. I see a Gronk. Everybody agree? We speak his name less. That is true. We speak his name less. Um, okay. Right hand. Raise your hands. How many of how many knew who this was? Oops. I gotta put his name up there. Okay. All right. Hands down. Unless I can do it really. No, I can't. I don't know how to make it. I think there's a way to say put everybody's hands down, but it might be on Zoom. Okay. Hands down. All right, who's that? I'll take a tech, a chat, a, a verbal. Okay, 
no one. Uh, oh, wait. Neither, nobody knows it. This is Tristan Worfs. Tristan is the Pro Bowl right tackle for the Buccaneers. And so he is essentially a leader on the offensive line. How many people knew his name? Raise your hand. I'm going to hope that there was nobody. Otherwise, people were being shy and didn't speak it. So why does this matter? So Tristan Wirth, so can, can Tom Brady function without Tristan Wirth and his buddies helping him out and being an offensive line that protects him and allows him to succeed? And can Rob Gronkowski similarly, can, can he succeed without a really good offensive line? Obviously, that's a rhetorical question. They can't. Um, but the interesting thing is the people who are um, doing a major part of the offensive work for a team, we almost never hear their names. Um, and we even hear the defense names before we hear um, before we hear the offensive line names, right? And so, um, but the offense, was there a comment? Ron, are you talking? Are you, okay. <laughs> Um, so we hear the offensive line. We don't hear the offensive linemen's names very often, but they do an incredibly important job for the team. And so I think that a practice change team is a lot like the offensive line. There, it, practice, doing practice change is not sexy. It is not um, glamorous. There is nothing that's really exciting about it, but it is incredibly necessary for us to be succeeding. And so if we want to be an organization that's going to be able to um, lead uh, the process of, of practice change and lead in our patient care, we have to have a good process change process and a team that's going to do it. So this is the way I think we can be the offensive line of process change. There are a lot of models for how to do process change and how to do it well. Um, almost all of them were made in the 1970s. I think that was just the, the time it was they, they came about. And so we're going to look at a couple of them very briefly. Um, the first one is Lewin's, cha Lewin's change management model. And so this one, the concept is unfreeze, change, and then refreeze. And so unfreeze is, we've been doing this practice all the time, so why should we change? We've been doing this for 30 years. We've been doing, this is the way we do it. Why should we change? Um, and, and so unfreezing is an incredibly important part of the change process, understanding why it is that you need to stop doing what you're doing. So if the literature were even stronger, I think we'd all say, yes, let's do trans transamic acid because our patients are going to do worse if we don't do it. Um, we need to have literature that's going to help tell us that. Then we need to come up with a change. How are we going to do it? We're going to teach everybody about the, the, the function of tranexamic acid. We're going to um, make sure that it, the pharmacists know and it gets in the Pixis. We're going to teach the nurses about how to administer it. We're going we're to put it into our guidelines so that we know when a patient comes in and there's this much hemorrhage, then, then it's going to go in that process. So there are lots of things that, that have to go into that. And then we need to refreeze it because if we teach people how to do it and we, we start doing it, but then the champions fade or the champions move on and go to someplace else, then it's going to slide and melt and slide right back into our old process until it's really locked in place. The other thing that we have to pay attention to that Lewin said was there are forces that go in both directions. There are forces that say we need to change. And all of these change management models were made about business, not about patient care necessarily. So the things that say we should change, we have to improve customer response time. We could say that same thing really in our patients. We could we need higher margins. We need the higher margins if we're if we're going to be able to have a, a viable organization and keep taking care of more and more patients. Improved access um, and then lower ongoing cost. So those are the things that say, yeah, we got to change because this thing needs to change. But then there are all these things going in the opposite direction. It's difficult. Um, we need new skills. We need to have we need to have an um, change practice that's going to impact our workload. We're going to have to have more patients and 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 it's going to take extra time. Um, and then also it's going to, could be costly. So we have to make sure that in order to make changes, the forces have to be going with us and not against us um, or else we're never going to make the change work. This one is interesting because I think this one is pretty important for large organizations. And I think we have with this network and um, with other aspects, we do have a very large organization that has a lot of interaction in various places. And so trying to change one thing then impacts something else. Um, and so McKinsey's model talks about the three. So the three blue ones that are up along the top are things that are pretty obvious. 
strategy, structure, system. Those are the things that you kind of think about. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got to change those things. Um, but the gray ones that are considered the softer S's are there. They, they can't be discerned as well. You can't label them quite as well. Um, you can't measure them quite as well. Um, and so they're less tangible. But are they less important in trying to do a practice change? Uh, and I would say perhaps they are more important in trying to do a practice change because that's what's going to be important about getting the culture to say, I'm going to unfreeze now and I'm going to refreeze over here because I get it and I think it's important and I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to do the work it takes to make that change. Importantly, it's all interactive um, or it's all interconnected. This one, the ad car one, is just it's just the letters of the of the things, but I liked it because it um, can be it can be related to, to um, the Lean and Six Sigma methodology. And so you can actually, you know, in order to get awareness, you can actually do the defined portion of the Lean and Six Sigma. Um, desire, knowledge, ability, reinforcement. You need all of those elements to make a practice change. And the Lean and Six Sigma um, tech have essentially tools and techniques to do those things. And so I, I liked that one as well. This one I'm going to focus on because um, the this, this eight-step model for change uh, it's almost prescriptive. It says, look, you need to make sure to do this and do this and do this and do this because we we forget the things that we need to do to make good changes happen. So what are the things that we need to do? Well, we have to establish, establish a sense of urgency. If we all say, mm, I'm not totally sure if tranexamic acid is the right way to go, is that much of an urgency? None of us are going to feel like, oh my gosh, we're not doing the right thing. We need to change and do the right thing and take care of our patients and give, give it. So we really have to have things that are prioritized things that are urgent, that are important and, and or teach people why they're, it's important of what we need to do. And then we have to create a guiding coalition. That's probably 1970s language. What we talk about today is stakeholders. We have to get the stakeholders involved. Um, and this guiding coalition, important, importantly, not only is, is involves the frontline people who are going to be an, impacted most in their workflow, but it also includes the work, the, the leaders, because leaders are the ones who have to be involved and, and committed enough to it that they're going to help us undo the barriers for things. The vision and strategy. Well, we have to know if we know that we're we if we've decided that we need to give tranexamic acid, then we have to have a vision that we're going to give it to the right patient every time consistently. So that's our big vision. Um, and then we have to have the strategy, which talks about all those things that I talked about, about, about making sure that we're all taught how to do it, that the nurses know how to, the, the process and the administration, the pharmacy, all those sorts of things. We have to have the strategy for how to actually make it happen. And once we have that vision and strategy, um, we have to be able to communicate it to everybody and communicate and communicate and communicate it more and more, right? So we do that marginally well um, when, and, and none of it, and to, for no one's, to no one's fault, but um, you know, we send out emails saying, hey, this is the new process. <laughs> and then when, pe when, when we're all looking through our emails of 400 emails at a time, then how, is it, how are we going to remember that process by looking through the emails? And so um, we, need to, we need to get better about having mechanisms where people can have access to it. Because even if I do a practice change and I'm the author of it, and I'm in the trauma bay and I'm supposed to, let's say I'm, I've authored the one on training and I'm going to be looking at my phone saying, which which is the patient population, should I give it? And trying to find it on my mobile phone, and that's the email that I sent. Well, then I gotta scroll through my emails and find it. That's not a good way to do it, right? We have to we have to come up with communication processes that are gonna work and that are duplicative and that overlap and that really help us figure out how to do it. And then we have and then we have to empower that change. So we have to remove the obstacles. If an obstacle, let's say we decided to do tranexamic acid, and an obstacle is it's not in the Pixis then we have to do the things to make sure that it gets in the pixis so it's available and then change those structures and and listen to the people who are on the front line who have ideas, creative ideas a lot of times about how to fix something. We have to generate short term wins and this is the one that I'm probably the worst at because I, I don't think about it and I need to think about it and so I'm working on getting better at this one. But um, Planning for performance. So, so if we want to get to vision here, everybody gets it all the time. Who should get it? Then we need to we need to celebrate um, the people who are working on it. And I'm going to uh, uphold Julia Raditz, our our research manager, 
as being excellent at this because she has taught her team to celebrate when we enroll one patient in a study. And while that seems silly, it's important because it's a positive email and it's an uplift and it helps us move forward. And um, and so it's, it's helping remind us to do it. And so if we have those kinds of short-term wins, those are very, very helpful. And then the short-term wins have to be combined together to ultimately say, look, we're moving forward and we need to celebrate those short-term wins. We've gotten this far, we've achieved this, this percent of whatever it is we wanted to do, and now let's take advantage of that and move forward. And in fact, in this step seven, the other thing that happens is because you're succeeding with this part of this practice change, you actually start figuring out other things that need to move forward together with it. Because if we consider the, um, the, the, the seven S's, then we realize that everybody's moving together and one change we're making is is actually nudging something else along that really ought to change too. And so we start consolidating things and building them together. And then the final part is really about a lot about the culture of when we are making these practice changes, if we have if part of us isn't doing it, if there are people who are who are dragging their feet a little bit for one reason or another, they either have to help us understand that that there's a barrier or we have to move along. And so we have to really get the culture in place and established and it takes years is what I have learned, which I'm not happy about that, <laughs> but to, to set that culture in place. In general, this goes from step one to step eight, but the reality is there are lots of little projects in it while you're trying to make a change that are happening simultaneously and you kind of need to go back and forth a little bit. And so adapting to that, to that process. process. And then finally, these last two last couple slides, um, when we have change processes that need to happen, then we have people who are responsible for them. And so that, those are the leaders in this, this RASCI concept is that you have to pick, um, the leaders have to be responsible, they have to be accountable for making it happen, they have to support the, the frontline team, they can be consulted on what to do, and they have to be informed when things are working or when things are not working so they know how to fix them. This is not part of the literature, the RASCI matrix for non-leaders, but I made this up because I think this is an important aspect of it. And that is when we are doing process change, we're, even any given leader is not going to be the leader of every process change because there are way too many process changes that need to be happening. And so most of the time, most of us are not the leader. And so we need to be good, good non-leaders in the process. And so what is it that we should be doing? We need to review it and understand the mission and vision. Why is this process change happening? Because, and, and we can do that by asking questions and understanding the big picture. Where does this fit into the big picture and the goals of where we're going? Because we're responsible for making it happen and so we should do that. We also should come up with solutions. When, we're, when we've run up against it, when we've hit that obstacle, that obstruction in the road, when we're afraid of the water, when we're afraid of whatever might happen and we're struggling, we need to be, be creative and come up with the solutions. We need to communicate it with the leader when, when we are struggling and, and when things are going well so they have a good understanding. And we need to be committed to implementing processes, understanding that most of the processes that we're trying to do are probably the right thing, but we, if we don't get it, we, we need to learn, learn why and, and then take the initiative to move these things forward. Because if we're not doing the new evidence, is it possible that we're actually doing the opposite of our Hippocratic Oath and we are actually causing harm to our patients? So my charge for us is that we are the offensive line. And it's not cool and exciting, but it's incredibly important. And it will uplift those people who are going to be celebrated for being um, our leaders in being the best organization we can be in leading in patient care. Thank you very much. I am happy to take questions. Go back to this one because this is really what I want us to do. Did you all leave? All right. Hi, well, you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I guess the question is what, what you know, 
um, what what's our what's our step here regarding um, this as a system issue? Because the, uh, the MTAC is obviously not a single institution, but uh, we represent uh, a obviously a uh, major referral center is a level one trauma center, but there are also five level three trauma centers and uh, uh, over probably over two dozen EMS agencies uh, involved in uh, the trauma system of bringing these patients uh, it, within the system itself. So what is our next step here? Are you thinking for, for tranexamic acid in particular? Uh, well, we could even globally say it to uh, for traumatic brain injuries in general. Uh, specifically, we're talking about Obviously, the primary injury has already occurred. So, how are we going to impact uh, or potentially impact the secondary brain injuries? And, and again, what what is what is our next step as as a trauma and as an as an inclusive trauma system, beginning from uh, the nine one one call to uh, our ICUs? Yeah, well, I, I you know part of the reason I brought this up is because there are so many things that we are doing in order to. Um, try to do patient, do the optimal patient care that we need to do. We need to have a good um, process of doing these practice changes consistently and getting everyone on board and working together and understanding that that we may make a recommendation perhaps as a as a as an MTAC and then we have to figure out how help the um, the teams on at each of the hospitals and the. Um, uh, the medics, the, the ambulance team crews to be able to know the, those new processes. And so that's why I wanted to share this because I think this is something that we could do better as a group and utilize this as we're trying to figure out the next thing that we need to do clinically. From the standpoint of the tranexamic acid, um, I, I actually think we should probably decide either yay or nay, we're gonna give it to our um, isolated traumatic brain injury patients. Um, my vote is probably nay um, at this point because I don't see enough benefit from it. Um, however, uh, we we certainly could um, have some. We probably should have some more discussion about it, and or um, take the take the tack that Dr. Diefenbacher said, and that is and and try to put our um, thromboelastogram access at the very front line, so that we can then say, okay, if we do it in these patients, it'll work. Um, so that would be my vote from this is that we, we move in that direction. Um, regarding all traumatic brain injury, I think we need to just make sure there are lots of ways to approach all of the um, uh, secondary injury to limit secondary injury, but, but ongoing education about particularly limiting hypoxemia, limiting hyperthermia. Um, I think those are the, the bigger, biggest ones we can impact now. Scott, it's going to put you uh, on the line here. Uh, you know, one of the issues we have right now, this uh, the, the uh, TXA is uh, pretty much embedded into the majority of our uh, pre-hospital protocols regarding uh, severe severe trauma. Uh, just curious if you had any uh, additional thoughts regarding uh, where we are with that. Sure. Um, so TXA is part of the state's protocols, the OEMS's protocols, and it's allowed to be given pre-hospital. Um, however, it's more in the multi-system trauma side of things with hemorrhagic shock, not necessarily with isolated head injuries. So there's definitely some leeway there, but it's not specifically addressed. Uh, but one of my questions was going to be, what can we do, uh, barring that, what can we do pre-hospital to maybe give you more information or speed things up to even make that decision and make an informed decision? I'm happy to have votes from other people <laughs> besides me. I think, um, you know, I think I would add a statement to it of uh, for the pre-hospital teams of not in isolated brain injury. Um, not until we feel at least that um, we have a strong uh, sense that it should be done. And Kathy actually has a good comment. And you know, we can we can pose the same question in the same literature to the neurosurgeons and, and get their input as well, um, just to have an, another perspective of people who are invested in this in this group. 
so we could perhaps take it to our um, neurotrauma outcomes uh, would that would probably be a good idea. Again, I think uh, you know one of the issues is the concept of what sounds like it's reasonable versus what is an actual outcome. Uh, and again, I'm not. I'm not uh, I think one of the challenges here is I think we really need to demonstrate um, a an, a problem or an issue that needs to be addressed rather than trying to fix an issue that doesn't particularly exist. So the question that comes to mind is the fact is if you have an isolated brain injury, what's the incidence of uh, active fibrinolysis? And I'm not quite sure that's really well understood. And I would, I would uh, make the same analogy to um, platelet mapping tags uh, being altered in traumatic brain injury, but not necessarily impacted by either platelet counts and uh, actually any impact on outcomes as well. So again, I think some interventions uh, uh, that particularly are not without cost uh, really need to be demonstrating a benefit uh, prior to initiating that. So I guess my issue for the brain injury would be, I think we the best initiation for this would be to study, find out what the incidence of fibrinolysis is for uh, brain injuries, particularly by stages. Maybe we can even uh, examine that within the uh, brain injury guideline criteria, uh, and then you know, potentially come up with a uh, strategy based on uh, a problem. Because uh, right now, I'm not quite sure we've identified a problem, but we're treating a problem that we're not sure exists. I agree. I see a bunch of uh, big players out there. I'm just curious if there's other input. Uh, I see Dr. May out there. Uh, I'd be curious if Dr. May and Dr. Gibbs uh, input regarding uh, empiric TXA at this point in time, just for, let's, let's say, isolated brain injury. Well, I, this is Addison. Uh, the, the question is, uh, gee, is there the right amount of data to make a change? Uh, humans tend not to make change very lightly, as Dr. Evans pointed out. Uh, there are unmeasured things that perhaps we don't know uh, on the other hand, in large, very large pragmatic trials, mortality was better, and the complications measured were equivalent or better. We don't have data that says that it's worse. Um, now, you do move from the trial uh, phase to an enhancement phase, and people's behavior diverges when they get beyond that. But I, I think, you know, one of the things about change that Susan maybe implied, I don't know if she specifically mentioned it, is, you know, if you make a change, it, you do have to be able to measure what you're doing. And measuring what you're doing when you're doing random things is almost impossible. So doing things consistently at least enables you to measure what you are doing. Um, and that's one of the problems with inputting uh, new clinical processes is that people don't actually apply them in the way that they should, and therefore outcomes become very disparate from maybe their intended use. So I, I personally think there's enough data to say we ought to change and you ought to measure before and after and uh, the literature should continue to be assessed. Uh, but to me, there's enough data to say there's uh, more likely benefit than harm in the right groups. It has to be used in the circumstances that it was described and extending it beyond those circumstances, you don't know what the impact would be.
sounds like we have one at least one vote for it and, and a good argument for it. Everyone, I think we ought to take it back to the group. We ought to include some input from the neurosurgeons and um, pick a direction uh, because doing because not picking a direction is probably choosing not to to be consistent about our practices and doing the best best possible practices. Yeah, I would. Right, any other questions uh, from the audience? We're kind of running out of time here. Any other I'll, thoughts? I'll throw in one statement. Uh, one of the things that you know, if, if you do not measure what you're doing, your performance is almost universally not to the level that you think you're doing it. Uh, if you put variability in practice on top of that, um, then what tends to happen is is your application of the things that you think you're doing really degrade. So I am a strong supporter of, gee, if, if we can come to a consensus, uh, create consensus and then do it consistently um, and, and measure what you're doing. All right, I want to thank everybody for uh, participating and uh, listening in, and uh, we'll send out some uh, flyers for next month's uh, topic uh, through our uh, social media. Uh, please uh, feel free to join us at uh, metrolinatrauma.org, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys next month. Thank you very much. Dr. Evans, thank you as well. Thank you.